SAFM. SAFM. 104 to 107. Ooh, yeah, Africa. Sing now, Africa. Sing loud and sing to the people. Let them give us something to the world. And not just take it from it. We'll ring the bells when you come back. We'll beat the drums when you come back. We'll ring the bells when you come back. We'll beat the drums when you come back. Our lost African music will turn into the music of the people. Yes, the people's music by the people's culture. And I'll be the one who will climb up the mountain, reaching for the top of our Africa days. For the poor woman working for the lazy lot Sing Africa sing Africa sing Africa sing Africa sing 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 Africa Sing sing Africa Let the illusions of our memories be off From the people's minds and souls music by the people's culture and I'll be the one who will climb up on the mountain reaching for the top of our Africa days while the poor woman are working up all the lazy ones see Africa see Africa see Africa see Africa see sing sing Africa sing sing Vusi Matlasela with When You Come Back 2010 on SFM 104 to 107. And uh, you're listening to Literature with Garabo Khuleng. Zboon P.E. says, I play too much music. I have to play music. Okay, it's the rules. And uh, thanks for the, I think it's Jill. Yes, Jill has recommended The Adventure of English. I will definitely look that book up. I'm sure I will enjoy that. Uh, Still coming up in the program, we have the Sunday play later on at 2.30. And we're going to talk about uh, the Boabab Prize for writing. And this is writing for youth and writing by the youth. And our doc and Roger Webster joins us for the fireside chat. I always enjoy that. Uh, little bits and pieces of unknown South African history. And then uh, we have uh, the part one of the Seychelles trilogy presented by Nancy. Richards in our documentary at around 20 to 3 and Pule Musiamedi is tour facilitator at the SABC and he's going to review 50 people who stuffed up South Africa by Alexander Parker. 
Now, I'm very pleased to have this book in front of me. It's uh, A.B. Kuma's Autobiography and Selected Works, edited by Peter Lim. Now, uh, Alfred Bittini Kuma is best known as the president who revived the African National Congress in the 1940s and was then defeated for office by the Congress Youth League. Less known is his important public career as a medical doctor and social reformer, or the continuity of his thought over three decades of writings and speeches in which he articulated a consistent critique of white domination, inequality and state policies of segregation and apartheid. Kuma's ongoing concerns with national liberation, health and black identity lends his works a curious resonance with today's burning issues. This particular volume brings together for the very first time the works of this major African political and social leader of the mid-20th century, combining his previously unpublished autobiography with a careful selection of his prodigious output of letters, speeches, pamphlets and submissions to government commissions. The subjects he treats range across politics, health and medicine, the past laws, gender, bear, taxation, housing, education, crime, trade unions, conditions in Alexandra, international affairs and the onset of apartheid. He narrates his own life and that of comrades and friends such as Charlotte Matreke and the great Kosa poet S.E.K. Mkhayi. The book opens up new perspectives on Kuma's life and times and on related themes of medical, social and ANC history. It's edited by adjunct associate professor of history and Africana bibliographer at Michigan State University. He's in the country to launch the book. Peter Lim, welcome to the program. Welcome to SAFM. Delighted to be here. Delighted to have you on board. Now, I'm interested in in your background and how you came to discover A.B. Kuma's work. Well, Karabo, that's a long story, but maybe it starts when I was 10 years old and my three sisters brought home some very famous Kenyan runners, including Kip Kino. And so over the dinner table for a number of years, my mother would relate these stories of the Kenyan athletes. And that this was in Perth, Western Australia, where I grew up. About eight years later, I had my baptism of fire in the anti-apartheid movement when the Springboks arrived on our shores. And it was very much like a, almost like a civil war. And so as an 18-year-old, I took to the to the hoardings and was confronted by big burly uh, rugby supporters and uh, far right wingers and I realised that there was a big struggle going on in South Africa. Over the years I met more and more South Africans including ironically because we're in SABC uh, one of your CEOs a few years ago Eddie Funde and when Eddie Funde arrived in, uh, to head the ANC uh, office in, in, uh, in December 1983 I was the first journalist to interview him. And over the years, I met more and more uh, anti-apartheid leaders, uh, Oliver Tambo, Alan Busak. And then I moved into the study of South Africa because I was encouraged by these South Africans, as I was trained as a historian, to try and look at some of these issues that might be useful in the anti-apartheid movement and back home to them in South Africa. And one of the people that intrigued me early on uh, was Dr. Alfred Bettini Oma and uh, the way that he was able to bring together the different provinces in South Africa, the way he was able to uh, bring together the youth and bring women into full membership of the ANC for the first time. And uh, also he was able to work together very successfully with the left, with with the labor unions, with the Communist Party. And and yet he was a a sadly neglected figure, ironically, because he was the one who had laid the foundation from many of those who later on saw him as um, too moderate, such as Man- Nelson Mandela, Madiba, uh, Oliver Tambo, Walter Susulu. So um, in the last few years, I've done a number of works around these areas, and um, um, I decided it was time also to try and do more to bring the works of African writers, of African political leaders, social leaders, um, into the public gaze, because although uh, paradoxically we have a well-established what the French call oeuvre or works of an author, we we have a a very extensive white oeuvre. You think of Nadine Gordimer, Boseman, um, uh, Kutsir, all fine writers, but also fine writers, uh, the poetess Nonsisi, Dr. Noma, as I've shown in the book, and... um, the journalist John Dubay. So this is part of a a new tack that I've been taking to try and encourage 
more uh, publications of forgotten authors, neglected black authors. And it's 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 a timeless um, occasion, considering that uh, this is the you know the hundredth year uh, that the ANC has 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 been has been around, and uh, of course he was he was one of the he was one of the major founding leaders. Now, w- reading about his early life, and I wanted to talk a bit about life writing and and how how we can use life life writing to to help people, particularly the next generation, engage with history. Uh, bringing history back to life because there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of um, apathy towards history, uh, particularly in South Africa, where young people tell you, "Well, I don't want to know about that past. Um, it's over now." That 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 kind of thing. But reading about Kuma's life and the way that he wrote about himself and his life, um, w- what struck you about his style of writing? Because I, I found I found it to be very. Um, he was very humble in his approach to himself. He, he tried not to blow his own horn, even though he was incredibly successful for a man of his background. Uh, he didn't come from a very wealthy family. They had to work very hard. And his work ethic and his hard work was not just an intellectual thing. He also worked physically. I mean, when he writes about how he had very little money in the U.S. to pursue his studies, he had to take some t- breaks between uh, studies to work, you know, as a farmhand, uh, to, to work as a waiter. He worked in, in, in factories uh, just, to, just to make ends meet. So his work was not only intellectual, but it was physical. What led to that work ethic and, and how do you think it shaped his attitude towards uh, his own life and, and the life around him? It's a really spot on question and perhaps that's another resonance with my own life story because uh, like the good doctor, I also worked in steel works on construction of roads and factories and so by the time I went back to the academy, I had sort of... Uh, got a, a much uh, richer insight into into the, the lives of ordinary working people. And I think you're right, his, his time uh, both in the Eastern Cape and the Transkei and working uh, to put himself through medical school in the United States uh, gave him a lot of this um, uh, directness, humbleness, as you say, but also uh, an openness to people from different walks of life. And so we see this later on um, in his autobiographical works, of which there are three that we've reproduced here. Some of these were um, uh, included in a series in the famous drum magazine in the 1950s. Um, But the actual manuscripts vary uh, slightly. Uh, There there is a a manuscript in in Witz in historical papers that has parts that were not included in the drum version. And, and parts of these may perhaps have been excluded because of political sensitivities, censorship, and so on. But getting back to these questions of his life story, his humbleness, I, I, I think he never lost that. He, he, he remained, like Mandela, a son of the Eastern Cape for all of his learning, his medical degrees, um, his relative affluence in Sophia Town, where he always you know, drove around in a unlike, say, Trevor Huddleston, a friend of his in Sophia Town, who would be walking the dusty streets in his um, in white cassock. hammock, white <laughs> cassock as Desmond Tutu described him, uh, the doctor would always surely be on his way in his car, probably an American car, either to give um, uh, uh, evidence at one of the innumerable government commissions that he presented uh, arguments on behalf of the ANC uh, or residents of Alexandra or residents of Sophia Town, or perhaps he would be in his car on his way to his surgery to treat uh, ordinary people. And his medical career, I think, also was a humbling uh, experience. Um, I've had problems with my eyes for decades now, and I've met a lot of medical doctors, and they, a lot of them have struck me by their humbleness, although medical doctors are often quite wealthy, certainly more wealthy than me, but often I've seen doctors take elderly patients by the hand patiently, walk them through surgeries, and be very comforting. And so I think this this ethos of care, the, the medical dimension is also important, and it also reflects perhaps African indigenous traditions of healing. And although he was very much... Um, enamored with the Western scientific method. He never forgot his African roots. And so he would bring those two uh, great streams together. And I think, so his role as a healer, if you like, 
his his house in Sophia Town, where we'll be launching the book um, uh, on Tuesday evening at six thirty in the Sophia Town um, uh, Heritage and Cultural Centre. Which is uh, actually the site. It's, that's actually where Dr. Kuma's house was. It's a yes. national heritage site. So and it was uh, called Impilwani, which is House of Healing yeah. or Place of Healing. And so I, I think he's an enigma in many ways because politically he sort of had a, a bit of a bad press since the 50s when he, mm. when after he was defeated um, uh, by the Youth League, he stepped back from politics. And certainly he wasn't perhaps cut out to be um, a man of, the, of, of, of demonstrations. He did lead some demonstrations against the, the past laws in the 40s. But perhaps he wasn't cut out physically or intellectually to be a, um, uh, you know, one of the young lions um, being jailed and that sort of thing. Now, Professor Lim, what I, I can't help but draw parallels between Kuma and Mbeki, especially when you look at the the, the, the recent, the more he, recent history of the ANC and how and how the Youth League came to sort of hold so much political power and the recalling of Mbeki from office, the kinds of criticisms that you'd get. Um, and, 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 and I, said, I think it speaks to black identity, where you have um, a man who is incredibly educated and, 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 and has an, an incredible intellectual capacity. Paradoxically, even though there is a lot of care and the concern is for the people and the liberation for the people, paradoxically, um, sometimes having this much intellectual capability can, can also isolate you because people see you as, you know, a, a bit distant, uh, a bit distant, not having the, the kind of common touch that people want from leaders when they want to agitate for change. Um, am I mistaken in drawing those parallels? No, I think it's it's very valid. And uh, in fact, that, that is one of the criticisms that Madiba has made of Omar, that he was... Um, uh, too dedicated, if you like, to his medical practice. He was too supercilious, too aloof. And yet, and it's true, and others have drawn attention to his class position, relatively wealthy. He could afford this big house, this wonderful house in Sophia Town, where we'll be uh, launching the book. Um, and he had a motor car, which most uh, uh, black South Africans didn't have. So there was a social distance, a class distance, an educational distance, perhaps. But yet other residents of Sophia Town, like Bloch Modisane, in his autobiography, um, respected and looked up to the good doctor. And they actually, he actually articulates in his own autobiography, Bloch, that he really would like a house <laughs> like Dr. Homer. So the, the, the comparison with Mbeki is intriguing in the sense of, the, if you like, the fall from grace. And yet both of them remained loyal to the liberation movement. Yes. Uh, although um, when Homer is uh, defeated, he he sort of becomes uh, a back backroom player, he still speaks out. And he is quite active in the protests against the forced removals in Sophia Town. Where the real rupture comes, I think, is in his open letter, uh, which is only... Uh, partially read at the ANC uh, conference, but which is then published in full in Bantu World, which was a white-owned newspaper. And so in that letter, he criticizes both the apartheid government and the more radical direction of the ANC. Uh, and so that, in a way, sort of sent him to Coventry. He'd sort of broken ranks. And yet, Later in 1960, only two years before his death, when the UN Secretary General Doug Hammarskjöld comes to South Africa and rather curiously gets to meet the doctor uh, rather than Albert Latuli, um, Luma says to uh, Hammarskjöld, you really should be talking to the leaders of the ANC, the, mm. the liberation movement. So he never really abandons the ANC. Uh, and he finds uh, subtle ways of encouraging the youth. He also talks to leaders of the PAC. So I think he perhaps saw himself as an elder statesman. And in that regard, I think your comparison with Thabo Mbeki is very interesting. He also had fairly close relations with Govan Mbeki, and the two corresponded, one in the big city here in Johannesburg, the other back in the Transkei. And they both had a, a very strong interest in the black press, 
because the ANC lacked its own newspaper. It's, it's still a problem, and that issue of the media and voices and African and who, voices and still who owns out. the media in and South Africa media, as yes. well. Yeah. We're talking to Peter Lim. He is editor of uh, Dr. A.B. Kuma, Autobiography and Selected Works. But taking your calls as well, you're welcome to join uh, this conversation on 0891-104207. Send us your SMSs to 34701. And uh, Sajini, Sajini Ndenze in Bloemfontein says, Kuma's leadership cannot be compared to the current ANC leadership. Current leadership is like a moving train with no driver. Well, that, those are your thoughts. And uh, you can give us a call as well, 891 104207 how did you go about collecting uh, all this work considering it, it it didn't get it didn't get a lot of attention uh, it didn't see the light of day in in the public's imagination uh, how easy or difficult was it to collate all this work and put it into a book that uh, that is intelligible well there's a wonderful um, uh, collection of his uh, unpublished works at vits in the historical papers and therein lies another curious story, because when his, his second wife was an African American woman, a strong feminist, mm-hmm. uh, Maddie Hall, and uh, there is another story about the empowerment of women in the ANC, which we could perhaps talk about if we have time. Yeah. But when uh, he dies, she um, is presiding over his papers. She gives away his books to Orlando Public Library, and they're still there. It would be interesting to go and look at some of those books and see if his name is inside the cover. Um, but his papers, his his letters, his essays, his clippings, his medical notes and so on and so forth, and his um, autobiographical transcripts uh, are all eventually uh, given by Maddie Hall um, uh, to, uh, to a journalist on the Rand Daily Mail. And the papers then find their way... Uh, Benjamin Pogrand, and the papers then eventually find their way into the South African Institute of Race Relations, with whom Luma always had a very ambiguous relationship. He resented the paternalism of white liberals, and yet they were in some ways eager to find ways to relate to the ANC and to him. And he became quite adept at getting donations from this organisation called the Bantu Welfare Trust in the 40s. At one stage, a donation of £1,000 for one year, which at that time was a a lot lot of of money. money. And so here was the material basis being laid for a stronger ANC with paid officials and officers. And it was that foundation where more radical and more outgoing leaders like uh, Mandela, Sisulu, uh, Latuli could come along and then really build upon that. So the papers are there, but they're also dispersed in other collections. And again, coming back to my earlier point about the need to get more of these sorts of things published so people can read them, I have another uh, edited book um, with other authors coming out from Witz uh, in September, which is the first history of Ubuntu Batu, which was the ANC's inaugural uh, newspaper in 1912, lasted to 31. And scholars uh, have always imagined that that newspaper had just disappeared from the face of the earth. And yet by careful uh, uh, research and analysis, we've and also looking in other black newspapers, we've been able to stitch it together like an enormous mosaic, uh, so that we can now recover this this lost uh, archive, if you like. And so in, in some senses, it's the same with Dr. Kluma. There are still missing parts of the mosaic. Uh, we still don't know, for instance, why in his autobiography he pays so little attention, say, to the years of World War II or to the mm. ANC itself. He's Again, is it because there is a missing section? Were there multiple versions perhaps still waiting to be found, maybe somewhere uh, uh, in South Africa? And so this is, uh, I think, one of the the good things about talking on SAFM. Maybe there's someone out there who knows of someone who's got some papers in a trunk or in an attic. This is what happened with Sol Pleike's papers. Yes. And, uh, they were found by Komarov and then... Uh, Brian Willen then developed it into a biography. 
So what I'm really getting at here is there are a lot of hidden treasures out there maybe that people are sitting on. Don't throw away those those old papers. Please don't. <laughs> Please don't. You can start with us and we'll get them to the right people. Now, uh, I'd like to discuss uh, Kuma's, um attitude towards uh, gender and, and his particular agenda in, in, in you know, pushing for women to be able to hold proper office in the ANC and uh, to, 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 play, to play the role that they deserve in... In, in, in pushing for change in society. Yes, I think he must get credit for this. Uh, and here is another big gap or lacuna in ANC history. Uh, we don't have a history of the Women's League. So I'm talking about a scholarly history. We have some nice pieces done by uh, Freni Jinwala, for instance, uh, and others are working on these themes. Uh, there are a lot of excellent um, South African uh, feminist historians who are looking at different aspects of this. But when you think about, um, say, the, the political role of African women is, is very much neglected. Mm. And so here, uh, Homer comes to the, 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 the fore. It's only when he is uh, president general of the ANC that women receive full constitutional membership rights. And this is a part of his constitutional changes. One could ponder whether part of this was the influence of his African-American wife, yeah. Maddie Hall, uh, and perhaps uh, this is uh, true, or maybe as a couple they realised this. Uh, I've often posed it in the sense that, as with the youth and with the youth league, because remember he was the one who gave the green light to the youth league and then it was like the cat was out of the bag. Uh, AWG champion in Natal warned him against this. Uh, he said, no, you mustn't let the youth league come on board. They the will young lions you. in their cage. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. And I think it was the same with the trade unions and the same with, with women, that he was sincere in his love of um, the youth, the, the women, the trade unions. He, he hated the suffering that he saw when he went to Alexandra as, as the medical officer of health. And he, I think, he wrote, in, in, we see in his letters, he writes to Champion, he says, we can't get anywhere without the women. We have to bring the women on board. Because Champion was even more old-fashioned. And that, I think, was part of the genius, part of the initiative uh, that he brought to the ANC, was that he was much more gender-conscious. Sure, he had with him some of these patriarchal attitudes, but he was uh, very much uh, forward-looking. And, certainly, and for that yeah. time and that age, just globally anyway, it, it yes. was an incredibly revolutionary thing to do because, I mean, the 60s, um, you know, the, 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 during the 50s, it was still, you know, the, the feminist movement was only starting to, to sort of seriously gain momentum after the losses that had been made, um, you know, post the suffragettes with World War One and World War Two. But uh, thank you so much for, for, for coming through and for making uh, this work possible. And also a very special thanks uh, to the Van Riebeck Society. Now, um, they the Society for the Publication of Southern African Historical Documents, and they were founded in August 1918 to print or reprint for distribution um, valuable books, pamphlets, and documents relating to the history of Southern Africa. They've been doing this for over 90 years, and this particular volume is number 43 in the second series of the Africana Rare Book Market. But now it's no longer so rare, thank goodness. So um, they published, they have published Dr. A.B. Kumab autobiography and selected works for 240 Rand. You can send them an email uh, to find out more about this book. I'm pretty certain that um, th th they're working hard to get it in the bookstores. But you know, sometimes with history, that's really important. <laughs> sometimes the stores just don't pick it up. So send them an email to fanribk, that's F -A -A -V -A -N -R -I -B -K, V-A-N-R-I-B-K, at mweb.co.za. Or you can visit www.vanriebecksociety.co.za. Call them on 021-423-8424. That's 021-423-8424 during office hours. And you can find out uh, where you can get this book. If you're a bookseller, uh, you can order it from them to stock, stock it in your bookshop. And I think this is a really important work, considering we're talking about 100 years of Sophia Town, 100 years of the ANC, 
Abi Kuma, autobiography and selected works, edited by Professor uh, Adjunct Professor of History and Africana Bibliographer at Michigan State University, Peter Lim. Thank you so much for joining us on SAFM. Thanks, Karaba. And you can also uh, attend the book launch. It's happening uh, at the house, uh, the, the original Kuma residence in Sophia Town. Uh, it's on Toby Street, and uh, that it's taking place on Tuesday at 6 o'clock, and the book will be available for sale there as well. It was a pleasure having you on the program. Having you on the program. Having you on the program. Having you on the program.